Welcome to Fintech Insider Interviews from Money 2020 in Amsterdam. I'm thrilled to be joined by Patrick Gauthier, VP of Amazon Pay. Hey. Good morning. Is it good morning for you? Uh, Seattle, Amsterdam, jet lag? It, it's, it's in the morning. Yes. <laughs> Middle somewhere. of the night, somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, we've got to start off with what's Amazon Pay? Amazon Pay, it's quite simple. It's the service by which any Amazon customer can uh, shop at other merchants. And what we enable uh, those merchants, those customers to do is to uh, leverage some of the information in the account of those customers. Okay, the most natural is payment method, but uh, the address book, your prime status, uh, the information the consumer chooses to release to the merchant, then the merchant can use to remove friction from the transaction. I've used it, actually. I have used it. And I, have, I did find it, one, uh, it was, there was a trust element because I use Amazon quite a lot. I'm an Amazon Prime member. But secondly, not having to put in delivery information and where you can deliver it to and what my credit card is, sort of fed it right through. Is, is that the standard use I case? I rest my case. I mean, literally, you said all the reasons why we're, we're in this business. Trust. Uh, the reality is... When you ask consumers what they care about in terms of where and when and how they shop, the number one reason is not price, the number one reason is not availability, the number one reason is trust. And so, yes, there is a strong, especially for prime customers like you, thank you, uh, there is a strong bond of trust with Amazon. We don't take it lightly. We think, you know, this is something we need to nurture every day, every transaction. But that trust also enables us to do things, in particular in the context of another merchant, uh, that will result in, in less friction, right? Familiarity kind of translates into, uh, into a better experience. And then we use the technology to sort of think of how we can remove that friction, not just in checkout, but at other times in the, in the purchase journey. So an example, like today I will, I'll be talking about voice, you know, everybody is talking about, oh, buying with voice. But the reality is you can do so much more before, during, and after. And so that's the kind of the lens that we put. Like, where can we remove friction from the experience of the customer? And we know that when we do that, we nurture the relationship we have with them. We also benefit our merchant partner. It's a win-win. I guess there's a, um, there's a trade-off, though, and we've seen this famously with uh, Facebook, who brought out login with Facebook, and suddenly people are using that. But there was always this question about privacy and one company collecting all this data and using it against us. Do you see, you know, issues, problems with that as well? Well, I don't know if it's uh, an issue or a problem. It's definitely something we pay attention to. I mean, we are, uh, we are very, very sensitive to protecting the privacy of consumers. There's a couple of you know, practical ways in which this uh, translates. We never share any information without the explicit consent of a customer. We don't monetize data. We don't sell data. We provide services that may leverage the data that we have uh, for a better experience, uh, but we don't monetize it. An, an example, for instance, how we, we, we leverage the data we have. Um, with Amazon Pay, we use the same risk engine as we do on Amazon itself. So we're able to leverage the data that we have about all the activities that that buyer does to make sure this is really Patrick, this is not somebody impersonating Patrick, to protect the buyer and of course to protect also the merchant. That's, that's the way we think of data. Protect it at all costs, use it to have better services and do everything with transparency as far as the buyer is concerned. So is that the value proposition for the merchant? Actually, it's uh, frictionless for the, or less friction for the consumer, but for the merchant, there's yeah. a risk element as well? Well, for merchants, definitely risk element. Generally speaking, for the merchant, you know, a higher conversion rate. So a, a declined transaction for, uh, uh, for risk purpose, right, would be, uh, would affect your conversion rate. For merchants, we fundamentally help them in two fronts. One of them is uh, better conversion. The other one is they see net new customers, in particular prime customers. So we definitely see a strong correlation between the prime status of an Amazon buyer and their propensity to use Amazon Pay. What we also know is that the prime buyers have a bit of a more binary uh, relationship with, with Amazon. And as soon as Amazon Pay is on a third party site, some of those prime buyers will be more willing to interact with that merchant. 
maybe counterintuitive, you know, how many how many retailers, quote unquote retailers, do you, you know, do you know that share who their best customers are with a third party? Uh, and yes, it's counterintuitive, but we do it because it solves a customer problem. And we have 20 years of history that shows when you solve a customer problem, it's good for your own business. And it's an interesting evolution from, you know, selling books, moving out, selling other things, your own stock, to then allowing other people to host on your site, to now going out to actually their sites yeah, and doing yeah. some stuff there. Um, yeah, I know, it's, but uh, at the same time, it's not so surprising. So, you know, um, Jeff uh, has, has a few principles that really apply to everything we do. The first one is solve a customer problem. Always start from a customer problem. Be clear on what you're solving. The second one is, you know, lots of things change in the world, but there's th certain things that remain constant. You know? uh, most people that I know are not looking for a less convenient, more expensive experience with fewer things to get. Right? And so as long as you continuously understand that there are certain things that stay constant, now the bar gets raised all the time. As long as we focus on continuously improving the experience on those things that are fundamental to customers, business will thrive. So why go, you know, why open marketplace? Because more selection. Um, why open ourselves to, you know, uh, why enable uh, uh, transactions into third party merchants? Because um, as, as, as broad and vast as the Amazon marketplace is, there will be many, many, many other things and experiences that people desire to have. And so why should we not enable the buyer the facility of, of buying whatever they love, wherever they find it? Sure. So you've grown pretty, uh, pretty explosively, I guess, given, given your uh, Amazon spread across the globe. 18 countries in four 18, years? Yeah, 18 right? countries in four years. Uh, in particular, big expansion in Europe over the last couple of years. Uh, and uh, we've also grown in terms of a uh, number of ways in which uh, you can use Amazon Pay, right? So it first started on the web, not too surprising. Then we moved into, uh, into uh, mobile in 2017, 2016. And from there, we started to expand, so both in uh, in-store ca uh, use cases, as well as on connected TVs. And now, uh, really, a big area of investment for us is anything related to voice. And with voice, it's not just in the transaction, but it's also before and after. Uh, so example of after, uh, something I'll talk today about in the keynote, uh, enabling Amazon Pay merchants to connect to the Alexa notification system First use case is delivery, delivery notification. Why do we pick delivery? Because that's when we ask consumers, um, what are they interested in? 42% uh, in the US say we want to know where a delivery is, 37% in Europe thought it was a pretty good bet, right? Um, from a merchant standpoint, it's also so much more elegant as an experience and frankly less costly than receiving a call. Um, another component that uh, we've introduced, uh, we've just introduced, in particular for the European, uh, for the European countries with Alexa, is a, is a universal buyer identifier. And the point of this is to, uh, is to be able to pick up the customer journey from wherever they left before. So let me explain. Um, I drink a lot of coffee. Nobody's perfect. And from Seattle, I mean, it's obligatory, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. Uh, and so, but I tend to reorder the same, you know, like everybody, I'm a creature of habit. So, yeah, the first, you know, from time to time, I might go back into my specific order that I do about once a month. And from time to time, I just want to be able to say reorder. And it's so much easier if I just do it on Alexa, right? But that requires uh, the, the Alexa experience to be connected with the other experiences that I might have online. Another example uh, might be a uh, wish list, right? Um, oh, I know, I need to, to remind, to remember to do X. You know, pay the electricity bill on the 26th. And then being able to pick up from there uh, when I actually do the activity, which I may want to do online because that's easier, I want to see my consumption or whatever. So, you know, it's not an either or. We think voice complements a lot of things that you do online. And by threading the different touch points with a universal ID, we remove friction. Very interesting. And I, I like the, 
the uh, voice as a complementary uh, service. I think so many clients we talk to, big banks, are talking about, you know, holy voice. Let's, let's just focus on, on just the voice piece. But, but by adding it to the other digital channels, it becomes uh, something much more. Yeah, I, I think, well, there, there's a couple of reasons for doing it. First of all, uh, let's face it, the experience is different. You know, the, the way you interact with voice is very, very different than you interact with a screen, right? It's more natural. But on the other hand, you do not have a lot of uh, uh, context uh, permanence, right? With a screen, you know, that information remains. With voice, you may remember one or two questions before, but no, sure. it's, it's, it's the more discoverability dynamic. of, of it's more dynamic that, on voice. Sure. Um, and then, secondly, just like with mobile 10 years ago, or for that matter, web 20 years ago, we're not exactly sure yet what is the right set of experience. By the way, it's not just a question of state of the art, it's also a question of the progression of the consumer themselves. What is their area of comfort, right? Ten years ago, not a lot of people were doing mobile banking. Now, now it's more than half of people uh, because, because of sort of the growing comfort with yes, I'm protected and yes, you know, the, the, the evolution of the UX that is ever cleaner and cleaner. And the same is going to happen with voice. So when you think about it that way, it's very natural to look at it as complementary to what you might do in your other channels. So have you seen uh, different challenges in the different 18 countries? I see, you know, for instance, that you've uh, recently launched in India, which must be a very different market with uh, Flipkart and Paytm and all of those sort of yeah. guys over there. Yeah. Like, what's it like in yeah. different countries? So, you know, one of the, I've been in payments for <laughs> longer than I care to tell. And one of the things that makes payment interesting is, is indeed those so many nuances we have on there, including cultural nuances. And so when you're, when you're in, the, in, the, in payment and transactional business, you have to both, at some level, have solutions that can be globally deployed, but yet also locally executed. Because uh, different consumers in different areas of the world have different attitudes towards payment. US and England are far, far higher propensity to use credits than let's say mainland uh, Europe. Uh, Germany and Japan have a strong attachment to cash. Compare, for instance, to northern European countries where cash has been on the decline for you know, almost two decades. And so in countries like in India uh, or in the Middle East, which are still massively cash-dominated economies, there is this uh, incredible push to, for electronification of cash because through that, uh, really comes the opportunity to accelerate, uh, accelerate the, the economy generally by, by leveraging you know, digital technologies. Um, so you mentioned your sort of vast experience of payments in terms of PayPal and Visa and now Amazon. Um, you know, we're at Money 2020, there seems to be EPOS uh, uh, innovation, there seems to be MasterCard, Visa, all the big card schemes. We've got Alipay that's using its Chinese presence to come across into Europe. We've got Amazon Pay that's pushing through. How do you sort of think about the market and what everyone's doing and how Amazon uh, is, is competing there? Well, you know, the North Star at Amazon is always start from what we can solve for the customer. So, to some extent, even though I've been for a long time in payments, uh, and even though it says Amazon Pay, I actually don't think of this business as a payments business. I think of it much more as a trust intermediation business. And, and it's, a, it's a nuanced difference, but actually it's far reaching because it means, for instance, that we don't limit our perspective to checkout. If there are things we can do in check-in, right, when the customer arrives, that will remove checkout steps, then everybody wins. And so, um, you know, often case, uh, I think the traditional part of the payments industry is very focused on payments for the sake of payments. Our focus is on buying and removing friction that consumers may experience when buying. I think it's interesting because we, we, we see that a lot, the, you know, whether it's lending or payments, the traditional way of looking at this thing is a financial transaction. 
but the context that it happens in, uh, and especially the ability to layer in these intelligent digital services that are coming along, means that actually every lending a action is not just lending. It it's very specific. And, and then buying is very different from payments because you've got all of these jobs to be done, you've got all of these needs. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I don't know anybody that wakes up in the morning and says, today I want to pay for something, right? Yeah. Uh, but you said something really important. You used the word, the word context. Here's, I, I, you know, heard it here first, but I, I, I will submit the following. The last 10 years, especially in digital technology, have been a quest for keyword relevance. I submit that the next 10 years will be a quest for context relevance. And, and what this means is no longer will you connect based on you know, a snippet of information about what the customer is doing in that moment. Increasingly, you will connect to the customer's context and story and help across multiple touch points to remove friction and to simplify people's lives. That, I think, is, is, is what's on the horizon, and that's why, that's why we're leaning into voice, because you know, we say voice, but voice has existed for a long time. What has not is the AI behind the voice. And when we, when we talk about voice, what we're really talking about today is, is smart assistants, uh, where the, the, the technology is progressing in leaps and bounds, and we're really in a position to actually create delightful experiences, and simpler experience for consumers. So. I love the context piece. I, I, think that's, uh, I think that's a great, I'm going to quote you. Um, uh, I, in, with this journey that you've been on, what do you know now that you wish you'd have known five years ago? Oh boy, how long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so I, I have, uh, I've been very lucky to be at Amazon now for, for four years and um, there's a couple of things that always were uh, on the horizon, but uh, that have really become much sharper for me. The first, really this notion of nothing matters until you're clear on the customer problem you solve. You know, how many times do you go at conferences like this and you see great ideas, interesting ideas, but you're not sure whether they solve a problem, Sure. right? And lots of energy can be spent on that. And so, you know, I, I, have, I have scars on my back because of that. I think, you know, that that's a relentless focus on customer, solving customer problem, which is something that is at the heart of what Amazon does. I wish I had really uh, understood both the power and the dimension of it much sooner in my career. And so for someone starting in fintech now or starting in this sort of industry, what advice would you give them? Be patient. Uh, you know, adoption, most people don't want to learn new ways to use money, right? And so adoption tends to come with generational shift. And that implies being, you know, being patient. Um, you know, mobile banking did not happen overnight. It took many, many years, right? The first, the very first time I worked on a mobile experiment uh, for commerce was in 1999 with the Palm 5, you know, oh, wow. with the, little, with the yeah. little antenna, you know, black and white, right? And, uh, and this was, you know, an effort of providing uh, locally relevant coupons to buyers. 1999, 20 years ago. So I think, you know, it's super important to have patience when you are, when you are in a money-related business, even if technology moves super fast the needs of consumers evolve more gradually. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much for having me.